start to say thanks a million to the session organisers for a great uh, day so far. So I'm going to talk about a particular type of castle in Ireland that is kind of the lowest seigneurial dwelling that we could possibly call a castle. And I'm going to contextualise this in a very broad, so we're going back way out beyond macro to the kind of whole of Ireland and Britain. Um, and I just want to tell you a tiny little bit about castle studies, which has for a very, very long time been a very kind of male orientated power um, military view of these buildings. And, you know, for 80 years or so. And so recently, in the last 20 years, we've had some landscape approaches. But obviously, these are macro perspectives where the castle is sited within its own particular space. Um, and its geographical features in that, and that leaves very, very little room for any sort of human-centred approaches, which is what I'm interested in. So the exploration of elite households, which are castles, they are elite residences, um, have been less explored. And although there have been symbolic interpretations, so the idea of the castle as a marker of status or power or um, representative of the identity of the patron um, and his, his particular family or um, kind of lordly realm is, 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 is also present, but really, really, they're not, not really that explored. And honestly, the thing that is never explored is what actually happens in these spaces. How is the space used? And I mean, and I know this sounds like a very kind of obvious point that people lived in these houses, you know, people lived in these buildings. They are um, zones of pure occupation for families, for Lord and his um, familia. And I want to be able to understand this much, much better. So, how did they fill their roles as residential spaces, and how did these spaces actually function? Um, and as I'm saying that I'm really concentrating on a very particular type of building in Ireland in the medieval period. And one thing I want you to remember throughout this whole talk is that coming, kind of following on from what Professor Sharples was talking about earlier, that the rise of um, privacy in the 13th century. So during this time, the hall and the chamber are completely separate buildings for the most part in Ireland. Obviously there are exceptions, which I'm not going to talk about here. Um, so the medieval hall itself is a, is a public building if we want to talk in those very traditional binary understandings. But it has a very particular architectural signature. It's typically ground floor. It has a central heart, so this idea of light and um, kind of an area of warmth. And it's positioned within almost within the centre of the hall, but much kind of slightly towards the raised end, the dais where the lord and his um, family would have sat. <coughs> It has a low end as well where the services are, the buttery and pantry, the dry and wet goods of the household. And it's bright and it's public. Um, on the other hand, the chamber is a private space. It's where um, all the kind of activities that were removed from the public life of the Lord were carried out. And we have to kind of understand that the Lord was this very important figure in medieval life and he would have been had a very public presence. And so to be able to remove somewhere where um, he could carry out particular sets of activities that he didn't want you know, to be in the actual, the rest of the medieval space um, within the chamber. Now this, like the medieval hall, has a very partic particular architectural layout. Typically, it's at a raised level, so either first or second floor. Um, it was accessed, again, by a set of stairs. In the examples I'm talking about in Ireland, it was by an external set of stairs. In Ireland, so you can see they're not the sexy castles that you might be used to, but they're, 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 they are castles in the sense that they are from the lordly class. So what we have here are first floor entrances, latrines, and fireplaces. And these are always present in these buildings. Now, the problem in Ireland with these spaces is that the hall had long been misidentified. So this building here we see is a chamber. It's a private residential space. It has first floor entrance. And you can't see the, the, the latrine here for reasons I'll, I'll say later. Um, and as a result, the hall was only the building concentrated on in Ireland, even though they 
they weren't looking at an actual hole. And the chamber received very little attention. And this can be set into the kind of wider idea of castle studies as being about status, being about power, and nobody focusing on the daily activities. And so that's what I did in my PhD. So I took a load of these buildings, looked at over 100 of them, drew them, mapped their architectural features, and I began to see, you know, these are not medieval halls. There's no possibility. And so I did geophysics survey at a number of, of sites. And of course, as I said, remember the hall and chamber are separate. And outside, a number of these chambers showed up a long rectangular building with a central area of burning. So here we have this classic combination of the hall and chamber that we see right across the Anglo-Norman world at this time. I know in France, post-1225, that doesn't happen, but that's, that's an aside. So to kind of return to what I was talking about at the beginning, so want to look at how did these fulfill their role as residential spaces? How did they function? And I think that we can ask ourselves, you know, traditionally I started the talk as saying these are public or private, but we all know that humans never really operate in those really strict codes. So we're probably looking at something that is perhaps fully private or maybe semi-private. And by looking at the architecture, in particular the internal layout, we're able to kind of reconstruct in our imagination the type of ways in which these buildings may have operated. So obviously we're looking at buildings that have very little um, upstanding remains in terms of internal partitions or anything like that. And so they, they don't contain any medieval um, upstanding internal divisions. However, there are a number of clues or indicators such as fabric screens or such as um, that can, we can decide that they're into larger and smaller chambers. And, and there's a suggestion that these are probably timber or fabric, scr fabric screens. Um, so there are four ways in which we can kind of understand the spatial organisation and therefore how they were used within these buildings. There is the location of the primary doorway, the grouping of the latrine and fireplace in here. It's a bit dark, which there's a fireplace here and the latrine over here. Um, the grouping of windows and corbels, which are kind of uh, masonry protrusions um, or masonry scars. And so I'm going to go through each of these individually and just talk a little bit about them. So the location of the primary doorway is always diagonally opposed um, to the latrine, which is, which is quite interesting because the doorway, the main entrance, is kind of up those stairs coming towards the light end and it's always located on the south or eastern side, so catches the morning light, catches the last of the evening sun, it's on that um, you know, axis of, of um, visibility. Um, and the latrine is located on the north side, you know, cold, dark, obviously masks, odours, it has a very practical practical reason for being sighted there. Um, and we can imagine, you know, like if somebody comes up the stairs, they open their door, the first thing they want to see is definitely not the latrine over in the, inter over in the opposite corner. So we have to imagine there are certainly, even if we don't see them, there's certainly divisions within the internal structure of these. The latrine and fireplace then, both are located along the same wall on the northern side. So, you know, this is the cold side of the castle. It's away from the um, primary entrance. It's much more removed and therefore we can kind of infer from this that this is a slightly more private space. The grouping of them suggests their arrangement usually suggests that this was located in a smaller room. And we know by this time in, in other buildings, in, with a very similar con contemporary buildings, that there is this separation into larger and smaller spaces. So this raises kind of the question again, you know, how were these being used? Were they functioning as semi-private buildings? The grouping of windows is another indication of, of how these buildings operated because we have very... Um, uniform arrangement of windows in some of them. So we see here at Ballycurran in County Mayo that there's four windows at the top there, very, very clearly part of a um, single room where there's a latrine present. There is a later medieval division here, but obviously we can't, you know, we can't say that that was in the exact same location, although it does appear to be likely. And at Tom Dealey here we see have the same sort of thing, the arrangement of windows in a very similar space. 
But of course, there's always exceptions to the rule. And we have uh, another example at Lisboni here in County Tipperary, where the windows are arranged in, you know, pretty much no exact order. We can't actually say that, like in the previous examples, that they're opposing each other or that they're arranged <laughs> towards a particular end of the structure. And we can kind of, perhaps, I imagine that there was a very particular organisation for this based on the position of the stairs, the position of a number of lamp rests throughout the building here that would have held um, candles or some sort of lighting device to kind of brighten the space, though maybe maybe not when hearing this paper earlier. Um, and there's kind of a progression through the building. One of the interesting things of this is that this area here is the only one that contains window seats. So it can be seen as kind of perhaps like a waiting area or a vestibule where people are channeled through in a procession turning to the left through the building until they come to the more private space where the latrine and fireplace are located together. And if that's a little bit um, less defined than you'd like, we do have masonry indicators, so particular corbels which, do, which would once have held either partitions or timber screens, and they're at very particular architectural junctions within the, within the building, so at the entrance, between the fireplace and the doorway, and also at the latrine. And it could, they're, they're quite beautiful as well, they're really... Um, high status, elaborate stonework, that, and it's quite rare to find this in these buildings. And so it's possible, now it is possible that they held a roof structure, but due to their lack of survival in the other parts of the building, it seems here that the building would have been um, arranged on a sort of tripartite plan. Um, I'll just talk about one final case study here is Brennan Castle in County Kilkenny. This is a really, really high status building. It has imported stone, it has beautiful decorated stonework on the inside of the chamber that has quatrefoil windows, things that really, really don't survive that well at this kind of level of seigneurial dwelling in Ireland. Um, and this building has all of those indicators of um, uh, spatial divisions and arrangement. So it has the grouping of windows, it has an oppositional doorway in the tree, it has a corbel, a, a set of corbels indicating where a partition would have crossed the room and sectioned off the latrine and the fireplace and a set of windows which also have window seats. Interestingly, in this building, we have large square apertures in front of a medieval chapel and also in front of the stairs which reaches the first floor. So these are, again, at these really, really particular architectural junctions. So there's a constant signalling of how one can act within this space. So I imagine that these, obviously, these, these weren't <coughs> left for people to jump over because, you know, that's impossible because they're really wide. Um, so there would have been some sort of either a wooden, um, a, a series of wooden planks or some sort of perhaps a decorated um, um, set of boards, which would have, again, indicated that you're moving into a place that has a very particular set of rules, that you're changing from inside to outside, from public to private, and this would have been enhanced by um, climbing the stairs um, up, up to this building. So really what I want to get at here is why is this use of space so important and why is understanding and analysing the architecture in this level of detail so important? And I think that for them, it really tells us something about the people who are using this space at this time and that first of all the buildings were incredibly versatile. So if you have movable screens, they're incredibly multi multifunctional. And this, um, this is really apparent because these particular buildings, some of them remain in use for, for nearly 400 years, right up to the 16th century. And it was a period of building in Ireland when an, an, a, a number of other tower house structures were being built. But these, rooms, these buildings are always remaining in use, so you know, they're incredibly functional. It also is interesting because different rooms can be used at the same time by different people. So I know we were talking about households a good bit. And so there's this idea of a, a larger household, which kind of you know, puts paid the <laughs> idea that, that castles are just about um, men or just about defensive structures or anything like that, because we have families living here you know, who are using the spaces very differently. And I, I know that I, I kind of would shy away from understanding these in terms of a power display, but 
the idea that one person can occupy one space or has command <coughs> over a certain space or over the, the private space of the household is, is very, very interesting. And so we see this greater and lesser degrees of privacy manifested within the architectural trace of these buildings. And we see a private space in this incredibly public world of the medieval period. So the Lord and his family are able to withdraw to this sort of living space, but also to move further into the much more private realm where the, they have heat and light and access to the latrine. But equally, this can be used as a public space. So, you know, they can invite very particular special guests, climb the stairs, you know, pass through, process through the building so that the needs of so many people can be accommodated. And I think the key thing about these buildings is that they're socially exclusive rather than being public or private. Thank you.